Hello, this is Glenn Kennel joining. Well, hi there, everyone, and hi there, Glenn. It's David Murphy with TechFire. We're just going to get started in just a couple minutes here. Just going to uh, uh, let everyone log in, and uh, thank you to everyone for joining us. So uh, talk with you all shortly. Okay, thank you. Well, hi there, everyone. My name is David Murphy. I'm the founder and CEO of TechFire and delighted to have a wonderful group of uh, speakers with us today. Uh, we're just so privileged to have uh, uh, with us some real experts on uh, today's topic. And I want to thank uh, them, of course, for joining us. And I want to thank all of you uh, who are logging in uh, as we gather separately here. Uh, and it's just, uh, you know, uh, good to be able to be with you if we, even if we have to be virtually. Uh, together. I want to give a big uh, thank you to the city of Burbank, which uh, is, you know, I may be on the one on the screen here. I'm with TechFire, but the real credit goes to the city. They're uh, the ones putting this on and doing all the hard work behind the scenes to to make this happen. And I just want to, to thank the whole team. It's just so wonderful to work with. They are fighting for all of you, uh, fighting for the entertainment industry, fighting for small businesses and big businesses of all types in Burbank uh, and, and beyond. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just want to say um, thank you to them and uh, and just uh, you know if you haven't joined us for any of our programs before do check out uh, the city's website burbankca.gov where you can click on the COVID-19 resources page and look under business resources you can view videos of our past programs we've done three webinars uh, on everything from uh, paycheck protection program loans which I hear are starting to flow now so <laughs> there's hope uh, to uh, uh, e-commerce and, and everything in between so um, uh, anyway, it's an honor to partner with them, and it's an honor to partner with the Burbank Chamber as well, which we're very grateful uh, to have joining us as a partner for this program. So thank you very much indeed uh, to everyone involved. Uh, and, you know, I really want to jump in here without uh, much further ado, because we have such a great uh, jam-packed program. Uh, we're going to uh, be able to jump in uh, uh, first with a a really, I've seen a preview of the slides, it's going to be good, with a really great uh, overview of where things are right now, we know the industry is struggling. Uh, you know, we know that uh, things are tough. Uh, obviously, the entertainment industry for many companies, for you know, for some, obviously, as we all uh, work and uh, watch from home. Uh, you know, obviously, there's a lot of great numbers out there too. So it's not all bad. But but how do we make sure that you know, as we 
uh, start to think about reopening. Uh, you know, how do we make sure that as many companies, uh, you know, survive and, and thrive? And what will things look like when we come out the other side? Uh, we'll get a, a preview of some thoughts uh, kicking off uh, with Peter Chaudhary uh, in just a moment. He's the founder and chairman of Creative Media. Uh, he has been uh, uh, in a number of roles with a number of uh, major leaders in the entertainment industry. I'll actually let him run through his, his career, but he has a new ebook out uh, that's right on uh, the topic today called Viral Media Entertainment in the Age of the Great Pandemic. And you can uh, get a copy uh, from uh, his website, uh, creative.media, that's C-R-E-A-T-V dot media. Uh, and uh, without any further ado, uh, Peter, I'm going to uh, turn things over to you and and uh, just want to thank you so much. Uh, I know we were exchanging, uh, you know, uh, the drafts of this uh, slide deck, put a lot of hard work into it, and uh, we're just so grateful to you. So kick it off. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, excellent. Good to be here. Let me just make sure I get this on my slide deck up so we're ready to go. Okay, excellent. Can you see that okay? Looks great. Okay, excellent. Um, so first of all, David, thanks for organizing this. Like you said, um, I'm going to go rapid fire because I'm going to try to go through this in 20 minutes. And my presentation will focus, it typically focuses on, on all sectors of the media and entertainment space. I'm going to focus primarily on the video side, movies and television, production, things like that. But I will also, I will also touch upon, uh, just very briefly, on music and immersive, so VR, AR as well, OK? So with that, uh, let's see. All right. Hold on, guys. I just want to make sure that, OK, there we go. So I'm. In part one, very quickly, I'm gonna set the stage of where we are. Part two, the in-home entertainment winners. So now with the pandemic and with all of us forced in quarantine time, uh, you know what that means for, for us and what that means for the players in the space. Part three is gonna be those that, and primarily the out-of-home entertainment players who are really the, the losers, um, not because of the things they're doing, but because of the time. So I don't want that to be a pejorative term. Part four is the media and entertainment business tomorrow, post pandemic. So really where things will take us. And then going very quickly into where things go well beyond that too. And then also just a quick statement of what it means to, to those who are in attendance. So with part one, I'm gonna set the stage. And it really is primarily an in-home, out-of-home dichotomy in terms of the winners and losers. So first, in terms of the use, the the behavior of consumers as we're locked down. Not surprisingly, we are, we are spending more time leaning back on our couches, watching. So you see Netflix streaming from pre-pandemic to current quote, uh, quarantine times. You see the significant rise there in the middle, middle top. Facebook, more on like the laptops, on those kind of devices, not as much on mobile devices. Mobile usage, app usage has has either stayed steady or gone down. You see YouTube usage on, on the YouTube app. But so it's really lean back behavior and more passive in that way has really shown, not surprisingly, um, a big rise during the pandemic times. Video games. Video games have already big, primarily with maybe with our kids, but a lot of us do them too. And esports and video games have gained substantial traction because of people are stuck in home. TikTok is something that's not just in the um, music space anymore. So videos on the TikTok app, actually, because they're interactive, have gone up significantly. While sports, traditional sports viewing and the sports industry, of course, which is out of home entertainment, has gone down significantly. So that's really hurt ESPN as an example. So you see that on the right. And then we are all live streaming like we're doing right now, much more so than ever before. So that kind of behavior, not only in terms of communications and collaboration, but also in the media and entertainment space, um, music, musicians are doing that a lot. I'm not going to touch upon it more than that, but getting in new ways to engage with fans, new engage, ways to monetize, live streaming is here to stay, it was already on the ups, up, um, upswing, but its rise is much faster. So that's kind of setting the stage. So now let's talk about the in-home entertainment winners. Coming into our lockdown, 
our, the overall home television market, all platforms was about 265 billion in 2008, 18. The list of players in the space, of course, had already expanded to not just the traditional cable television broadcast, but the new tech-driven media companies like Netflix, like Amazon, which really begged the question because all these new streaming players and tech-driven players, including the Facebooks and the YouTubes, but really they start, when you see Netflix and Amazon and others creating feature films, and they're really introducing those into our homes first on streaming platforms, it, it already blurs the, what is the difference between uh, film and television anymore. It all kind of blurs, and even pre-pandemic. But now the leading pandemic storylines, um, the SVODs, that's the subscription video on demand players. So the streamers like the Netflixes, like the Amazons of the world. And, and then you have the AVODs, which are the advertising video on demand platform. So free, just like broadcast television that's, that's backed by uh, advertising. So we already had seen pre-pandemic that there was this cord cutting and people were escaping their bloated cable packages, which they felt were very expensive and going down into a more a la carte streaming driven world. And so that behavior, of course, is accelerated during these lockdown times as there are more options to choose from. And there's more like, um, you know, all you can eat by paying your low monthly subscription. Meanwhile, so those have been winners. Live linear television, so where you get your, um, your live sports, of course, like I mentioned, ESPN down, but even the live news, which is typically one of the bastions for uh, live linear television, that too has been hit because you can get a lot of your news via streaming apps now and for free. So those are some of the things that have happened. The great streaming wars that I mentioned, now you have Netflix that's joined by Disney Plus, that's joined by HBO Max is coming out very shortly, NBC's Peacock is out, and then Amazon Prime and all the others. So everybody's competing in these great streaming wars for our attention, and then there's other new entrants coming into the play, like Quibi, which I'll, I'll touch upon, that's mobile driven. But as you see here, Netflix, just hit 167 million paid subs. So their stock last time I checked like a week ago was at 52 week highs. We're streaming more than ever, of course, but it's not just Netflix. It's Disney Plus that just hit the 54 million uh, paid subscription number, which is pretty remarkable when you think that they just launched in November. So in less than half a year, they're already up at that number, blowing past their forecasts, which were very conservative early on. And, and then, now, although advertising video on demand platforms like uh, 2B TV, like Pluto TV, which was bought by Viacom, perhaps under the radar, but they're more above the radar now because we're increasingly squeezed for our dollars, especially now during these tough times. So we have to make our choices as consumers and advertising video on demand platforms are coming into play. So we're more accepting of them. But it's not just all the big guys. There are some smaller players that are focused on certain niches like Shutter is focused on horror. Then there are identity brands or so smaller media companies that cater to a specific lifestyle or a specific demographic. And so 88 Rising, I just mentioned them as they're a new tech driven media company that's created a brand that's focused on Asian youth pop culture and all elements of it. So that's video, that's music, et cetera. And then there's international markets. I've already mentioned the streaming wars as being a, a, huge, um, a, a huge headline. So the quick point here is that there's the offensive where everybody's trying to create exclusive content that drives us in. So the next must-see TV. And Netflix had set aside $17 billion this year for its original productions. For everybody out there who is not able to work right now, um, the one good piece of news is that $17 billion, which can't be spent right now, that money is here. It will be spent. The streamers in these streaming wars need to produce content. So that's going to be, uh, th that money will be there. There will be a bottleneck of production resources, but the money will be there. And then very quickly on the defensive side, what I mean by that is now you saw all these competitors like the D Disney Pluses, uh, uh, Peacock from NBC Universal, pulling back their most important franchises that were previously licensed to Netflix so they can compete more effectively against Netflix and keep their crown jewels to themselves. 
So Friends, The Office, those are two big examples of that. And then just Disney has um, franchise crown jewels like nobody else has. So that's something to keep in mind as um, we look at how much original content Disney needs to create in order to fuel Disney+. Plus. Very quickly in video, mobile, and social today. So for the smaller screen, mobile viewing is down, as I had mentioned. Um, although TikTok, which is this particular use case, particularly with young people, that is up significantly. The big story, of course, during, um, from major brands and major players in the Hollywood business that launched during the pandemic, I think it was April 6th, Quibi, the short form video, like premium video service that was, is the um, co-created by Jeffrey Katzenberg and Meg Whitman, that launched to, I would say, not as spectacular, at least that's the, uh, the rumblings in the industry, the kind of numbers that they had hoped to launch with. It's been pretty unclear exactly where they are today, but the, in the first day, it was 300,000 versus Disney Plus's. Hard to compare, it's not apples to apples, but nonetheless, Quibi, there are many skeptics about it, but there are many who hope that Quibi will be very successful when what they're doing is something that has never been tried before. Spending up to 100 million, uh, excuse me, $100,000 per minute for short form content. So content that is less than 10, 10 minutes in length. And then live streaming, I mentioned. Live streaming in the entertainment business is here to stay, not just for collaborating like this, not just for like webinars, but there will be, even in production, Hollywood production, there will be more tools, especially now, the need for more tools to be able to create stories, to edit together, to write together, but to do it with tools that are not just, um, uh, Google tools, but specifically made for the entertainment business. And then in terms of engagement, some live streaming platforms to know about are Bulldog Digital Media, which does premium live streaming for live events, for major events, conferences, but for musicians, musicians, Twitch, Stage It, Patreon, those are a couple others that are interesting. Okay, on the part three, on the loser's side, and again, loser is not meant to be pejorative, it's crazy times. Certainly the theatrical motion picture business, as we all know, theater shuttered all over the world. And that was a $42.5 billion industry globally uh, in terms of box office last year. So right now um, we have this production has stopped, movie theatrical has stopped. What happens when things open up? Well, there's gonna be um, the challenge to theaters, which was already significantly there now with the streamers, is going to be heightened. And what I see is that theaters will need to reinvent themselves into becoming more destinations. Some will have pre-shows, post-shows. Uh, Disney has a new partnership with Secret Cinema that points the way. But expect that because uh, the, the big story has been that Trolls World Tour was released first now into the homes rather than theaters because theaters were closed. So it was the grand experiment with windows shutting, theatrical windows shutting uh, in the business out of necessity, where Trolls now in the first three weeks has, has generated $100 million, $100 million in revenues for Universal, which is split 80-20, 80% goes to Universal, 20% to the online purveyor. So in the first three weeks, Universal made $80 million in Trolls. Let's compare that with the original Trolls. The original Trolls, which was theatrical release, was about $150 million theatrically in the United States. And typically it's about a 60-40 overall split, 50-50, 60-40 going to the studio. And it, first there's more as in the early weeks, but as it goes down. But if you look at the numbers right now, this in-home release of Trolls, of the new Trolls, has done about as well for Universal as the theatrical. So what that means, the genie's out of the bottle, I see more family-oriented fair major films going directly into the home now, following Trolls' as lead because parents with young kids, babysitters, all that. So I think that's here to stay. There will be more of that. Uh, I see adult-oriented stories are going to be, they already were being released first on streaming and I think that's acceler accelerated. So theaters are gonna be really focused on major event pictures. And that's going to be like the superhero movies for teens, really primarily geared for teens and young people. That's what the business is going to be like. That's what I see. So mitigating the current pain for movies, there's a need for fresh content. 
Um, Netflix's money will be there. There will be bottlenecks, bottlenecks for sure in production once things open up. So now's the time to experiment, collaborate, write, check out any sort of remote working tools you can and work on that. Really quickly, theme parks, location-based entertainment, live music, of course, sports, experiential entertainment, all slammed. And you see the stocks of Disney and Madison Square Garden Group down below and what has happened to them. They've fallen off cliffs. I'm a believer. They will come back. It will take significant time. But we do not live just by tech and streaming alone. We need to be out of our homes, rubbing shoulders. That's important to us. So post-pandemic, what I see happening is that the hunger for consumers for content will only increase over time. And now we have more platforms with which we can engage and enjoy it. So I, I, from a content creator standpoint and in owners of intellectual property, you are in a good position and now is the time to explore all the different ways, not just the obvious ones, that you can reach out, engage, tell your stories, experiment. Production will soar also. It's new golden age for creators. So content is king like never before. Content sits at the center of the universe and and with all of the different platforms, including virtual reality, augmented reality, live streaming, everything. And one thing to keep in mind, one of the great benefits of all these platforms is that the rules of the game for the locks on content creators have been blown off, where now you're not locked into 22 minute sitcom formats, anything goes, but you have to look at the platform you're creating for uh, and create for that platform. Your story is gonna be different for a mobile device than it will be for a theatrical motion picture. Interactivity and gamification will increasingly come into the video game. Bandersnatch from, from uh, Netflix points the way. Synthetic media, so these are just a couple companies. Synthesia is an interesting one that automatically dubs voice uh, different languages in real time into uh, to a person. So. There's a video that if you go to synthesia.com, David Beckham is speaking in multiple languages, like 10 different languages. We all love Beckham, but it's not because he can do that. It's because they're able to feed all these different people speaking in real time and his, the digitization is done in real time so it looks like he's speaking. Theatrical movies, like I said, will become more destinations. Our cars are, are gonna be more and more autonomous and so they will become more uh, escape pods for entertainment where movies, television will be immersed because we'll be passive, so we'll want to enjoy. Digital humans and virtual humans. We've seen digital humans with Carrie Fisher and the new Star Wars. Well, virtual beings are, are uh, like the Lucy Project, which I touch upon. These are new um, artificial intelligence generated characters that actually learn from being with you and grow up to be your pals. And here's, an, uh, here's a, a profile on Instagram that has 2.1 million users that known as Lil Michaela. She's a big social influencer and she's purely virtual. She's not real, but she has videos. She interacts with real people. So anyhow, and then as I said, there'll be more interaction um, outside of the homes. I'm a big believer in that. These are some of the winners and losers. If you want my deck, I can send it to you afterwards. Um, David will make sure of that. And then just a couple things to leave behind. And then I'll close. So by 2035, futurist Ray Kurzweil says that we will literally be connected to the clouds, our brains, brain computer interfaces. Elon Musk, new dad, proud dad, um, has a company called Neuralink that plans to test that kind of a connection in the next couple of years. Think about Kurzweil this way, just to, for our heads to explode further. Something he calls the longevity escape velocity, where each year, in, once we get to like the mid 2030s or 2040, each year that we live, technology is gonna enable us to live more than one year. Think about that. And the forces accelerating change, the next big change in media and entertainment will be so-called spatial computing, we had a change from, from our desktops or mobile and the internet was the next big, the last big change. Spatial computing in three-dimensional interaction a la um, Tom Cruise in Minority Report, that's coming. So anyhow, one, just the final piece I wanna leave to you. 
is that we're all stuck in our homes. Um, it's very challenging times. There's many more tools out there to collaborate than you may be aware of. And I urge everybody to be out there and look for them and experiment with them. And then another final thought, don't just assume that the winners of today in the media and entertainment world are gonna be the winners a decade from now. So here's some cautionary tales of Kodak, Blockbuster. We all thought Blockbuster was positioned well, then where is it today? So nothing's, nothing here is permanent. Experiment. And if you want more, then as David said, I have a new book I'm making available for free. So if you're interested in reading more about it, you can go to this site here and, and request a copy of the book and I'm happy to give it to you. So there it is. Awesome. Well, Peter, thank you so much. Uh, you know, I'm sure everyone's applauding <laughs> some high here. Just fantastic. I do recommend the book. Uh, it's, uh, it's got a lot in there. Uh, you know, you get a, a real sense from the deck here that Peter is someone who knows his stuff and, uh, definitely, uh, you see the link, uh, there, um, everyone should check it out. We'll, uh, We'll actually, uh, with your permission, Peter, um, you know, either send a link or send the, the book out directly to everyone, too, along with that deck. So thank you so much. Uh, just uh, really appreciate it. And uh, we are uh, just uh, so, so privileged here to have someone joining us next. Uh, that is the president and founder of ANR Worldwide, who probably has the coolest uh, background. It's not a virtual background. It's an actual wall there <laughs> behind you. You have to maybe uh, point out a few of them and, and talk about them. Uh, that, uh, but uh, as you can gather, um, given uh, the uh, you know, uh, words you see on the wall there, that is one of the most connected uh, folks in the music business uh, who just uh, you know, uh, has a global reach. Uh, so I think it's really interesting as we see the pandemic playing out in different ways around the world. Uh, he can fill us in, uh, you know, what he's seeing, uh, you know, how things are different, but we're really obviously interested here. He's in Burbank, uh, you know, uh, in, in the local perspective too, and how we can make sure that Burbank continues to be the media capital of the world, uh, you know, as we come out the other side here. So I uh, just want to um, thank you, Seth, for joining us. Uh, we loved having you at our Burbank Tech Summit uh, in person. We look forward to all gathering together in person again uh, someday soon uh, here, but for now, Great to have you uh, with us uh, virtually. And for those who, who didn't hear you before, uh, and I mean, everyone knows you who's in the business, but for those who aren't in the business, uh, just give a quick rundown uh, of, of what A&R uh, Worldwide does and, and how you got there. Cool. Uh, so a and Worldwide's main focus is artist and repertoire. So our focus is in discovering and developing talent from all over the world. And uh, we've been around for 20 years as a and Worldwide. My background started off working in radio uh, as a presenter and curator and realized over the course of time that uh, I was able to find music very early by traveling the globe and presenting things that I was really passionate about. And what I realized was that, you know, to Peter's presentation, you know, earlier, it, it's about being authentic, taking chances and being entrepreneurial. So there was no roadmap for me to figure things out. I just did it and I made a lot of mistakes but along the way. I also learned some valuable things and you know, from other people, from different experiences. And what I realized was that, you know, the world truly is flat when it comes to music. And what a and Worldwide does is bring together a correlation of all these different ideas from creative creativity from the music space, but also technology companies and visionaries and bring them all together into one platform where the music industry can really benefit from learning, sharing and experiencing different things. So we are in a global pandemic right now, as we all know, and I hope everyone's doing well and safe. And what has really helped me understand the music business for the future is the past. Because what I realize is, you know, there's different ways of doing things in the music industry. Um, not all sizes fit in every territory. So I think now is a time where the music industry can really innovate and learn, share and experience different ideas uh, just recently, I took an artist from, from the UK and realized my travels that during this pandemic, you know, nothing was really happening for him in, in the United Kingdom. But what I realized was there's a marketplace such as India where his music could travel. So a few weeks ago, I introduced him to an opportunity in India. And within a matter of literally 72 hours, 
He's now on the homepage of Spotify India, Apple Music India, Ghana, which is like the largest streaming service in India, uh, as well as Geo Sarvan, the second largest streaming service. Uh, features on MTV VH1 India, as well as on local, regional, and national radio stations. And that literally happened in the course of three weeks. So I was talking to this artist, name was Waiting for Smith. He was a bit frustrated as, as far as, you know, being stuck at home. And he's like, Sat, I don't know what to do. I go, now it's time to experiment, look at the world, and see where your music can travel. And from my experience, I think your sound would resonate well in India. And sure enough, you know, in that case, anyway, it's worked really well for him. So, look, I know, I know we didn't have a chance to really put together a presentation because we spoke just a few days ago and I was in the midst of a few other things, but I'm just kind of speak, you know, uh, casually here. I, I think uh, we certainly are in a challenging time for the music industry, especially certain sectors. Obviously, live business is going to have a tough time uh, for the immediate future. Uh, certainly, you know, the radio business is suffering uh, just because of uh, lack of advertising, especially on a local level, uh, when it comes to, you know, production. I think certainly being able to be in the studio with different writers and producers, that's going to be somewhat challenging for the short term. However, because of technology, there's ways to interact and do things creatively, uh, remotely, but certainly there's also opportunities. And, you know, as Peter mentioned earlier, certainly platforms like TikTok are thriving and have been, have been very important for the music industry in the last 12 months. We're seeing obviously areas such as Facebook becoming a face of new opportunity. Uh, certainly when it comes to, you know, um, platforms like, you know, Zoom and other streaming platforms, there's ways for artists to reach new audiences, not just locally, but globally. And I think when it comes to innovation, um, I remember back in around about 2000 when the first tech bubble sort of, uh, you know, impacted our community, um, people were not sure what was going to happen. And at that time, people struggled, but there's also a lot of great innovation. The same thing happened 10 years later with the whole global financial crisis where there were some big winners, but also a lot of, a lot of losers. But what came out of that whole you know, experience those two decades was a lot of innovation. And so what I'm seeing now, for just from talking to different label executives, different promoters, different uh, tech companies, different managers, is that the, the way of doing business as it was a few months ago, that's definitely going to change. And, you know, there will be some short term pain for the next I'd say 12 to 18 months, but things will improve. Music is not going away. You know, music is here to stay. You know, it really is the global language. And I think that's where I see a big opportunity for those that are thinking outside the box, acting local, thinking global, they will thrive and succeed post pandemic. I'm sorry, David, I can't, I can't hear you. <laughs> no, I just had to unmute myself there. Uh, you know, Okay, I just got to ask before we go any further. Uh, look behind you there. Any, any? Can you tell us about any of those uh, platinum <laughs> records <laughs> right behind you? Some of your clients uh, you work with. <laughs> well, well, sure. I mean, look. Uh, you know, to me, it's always about the artist. I'm just there as a as a conduit to help. You know, connect the dots. So I guess you could say, like the Coldplay behind me. Uh, that was a band that originally. Um, you know, the the major label here in the U.S. passed on them. They felt that they were too similar to artists such as Radiohead and Star Sailor and that the music wouldn't resonate. And so what happened was there was a gentleman called Dave Holmes who ran Network Records here in the US. And uh, I was doing some NR consulting for him. And he said, hey, Sam, have you heard of this band called Coldplay? I go, actually I have. And my friends at UK Radio uh, have all been singing their praises. And he goes, well, the label in the US just passed on them. What do you think? And I go, well, I think that song Yellow is a radio hit. And so what Dave and I decided to do was send out the music directly to our various radio relationships. And within a matter of literally, I think two weeks, uh, almost 90% of the station started playing Yellow. And then of course, you know, uh, Capital Records wanted the band back and they worked out an override. And, you know, it was just, uh, again, what I said earlier, you know, ultimately it's about taking chances, you know, and I've always felt that in the music industry, you know, the ultimate judge and jury is a consumer. So whilst, you know, a lot of labels will use data metrics to figure out whether or not a song is going to be a hit or not. To me, the number one driver has always been my gut. So whether it's Adele, Muse, Dido, Keen, um, The Temper Trap, uh, more recently, uh, bands like Shepherd from Australia, Wolf Mother from Australia, all of those bands that we worked with, 
uh, first and foremost, we heard the artist and view the artist from a fan perspective. You know, what do we think of their music as a, as a consumer of music, as a fan of music? And then we did the work to, you know, essentially find ways to build pathways to get the music heard by the consumers or to certain gatekeepers that could then help elevate, you know, additional opportunities. And eventually, you know, a lot of these acts end up getting signed to worldwide deals. So, um, you know, a lot of times when I talk to artists too, they're always worried about data. And I said, data is important, but ultimately what creates data? It's a human emotion, the human reaction. If you don't react, you're not gonna, you're not gonna get data. And whether it's large scale data or small scale data, if you see that there's a spark happening somewhere, then micro focus in that area, that territory or that platform, and then build from there. And so, you know, with all these artists that, uh, you know, we've, we've had a chance to work with, every story was different, every pathway was different, but ultimately what drove their success was passion, belief, and great music. You know, quality still counts. And I think, you know, the old saying, quality and convenience, I think that's gonna be more true now than ever before, because people have the time to really think about content, about music, film, TV, esports, gaming, you know, what really makes a difference? I think pre-pandemic, we were all on this treadmill, right? Moving at about a thousand miles per hour a day, you know, multiple social media platforms, our mobile devices, lots of other things happening to where we weren't really focused. And I'd say I'm guilty of that too. You know, every day was just like the same day before. It was just moving at a million miles an hour. And then I think now that we're taking a step back and having a bit of a reset, I think, you know, we're able to really think about things, whether it's, you know, physically, mentally, spiritually, or ways that we entertain ourselves and making sure that it really counts, whether it's making it in a good mood and putting in a sparring mood or just, you know, music that helps you take better care of yourself. And I think what you're going to see too is music going from being moment driven where it's about streaming, to more about moment driven where it's going to be about real artists that have a significant impact on your social, on your social being. Well, you know, certainly I, I will say speaking personally, I mean, music uh, <laughs> definitely helps uh, one cope here with all the, you know, the ups and downs and uh, of everything with, with life during this crisis. Uh, you know, it's uh, just uh, real gifts. Um, curious, you know, since you are a connector, um, you had to uh, postpone your own summit, uh, your own conference, uh, you know, and all the other wanting and dining uh, meetings that, you know, you normally be having around the world are not happening. Do you, do you find it's, uh, is it, is it much harder now or is it actually easier in some ways to get deals done to connect folks because everyone's, you know, not distracted. They're sitting at home with their <laughs> email and, and phone and head. Look, I mean, uh, artists are still getting signed to labels, publishing companies, so are songwriters, you know, to publishers. Business is still happening. Is it happening at the scale of what it was, say, a few months ago? And no, but I think the focus is more about quality now. And certainly market share is important, but I think ultimately now it's about making sure the acts that, you know, people are investing in can generate a return. And uh, so deals are definitely happening. And um, I'm sorry, I missed the second part of your question regarding... Well, just just uh, just how it is with you know, uh, if, if folks are are more reachable. Uh, you oh, know, absolutely. Uh, Look, I mean, I think ultimately, you know, to what Pete said earlier, it's still a people business, and okay. what's really helped us is the fact that we travel the world for you know thirty years plus, getting to know people, you know, getting to understand the DNA of each market, and so you know, what's really going to help us, you know get through this and I'm seeing it already because we're still doing business are the relationships um, because that's a difference between doing business and not doing business and certainly you know content is important and making sure you have great artists to work with but ultimately you know you can have the best art in the world but if you don't have the relationship to get it to the masses then then you're stuck so we, we're finding like right now the relationships really have become very very important and the way that we're doing business and we'll do business in the future. Uh, and, and, I, and again, I think, you know, with Muse Expo, the event we do here in Burbank every year, it is a global gathering um, where people build lifetime relationships, uh, not just personally or socially, but 
certainly when it comes to business, and I'm sure a lot of the folks that are maybe listening right now that either host events or go to events, I think we can all say that attending a conference or a, a social you know, engagement, we can all go back and say one, two, or many of those have made a big impact on our business, but also on us personally. Absolutely. And we can't wait to all gather together. Um, you know, but in the meanwhile, uh, we are reliant on those. Uh, it's interesting you know, how different industries are, are so alike who already have those relationships built uh, over the years. I mean, just like in the, the venture capital industry, you know, they're only funding startups that they may have already met with, they already yeah. have relationships with before. Uh, so it's all the more important for, for folks to, to know you, uh, you know, and, and you know everyone already because uh, it sounds like things are really only happening where, you know, those relationships are already in place. Uh, any other parting advice? We'll have some time in the Q&A later uh, for, for those who are in the industry who may be, you know, more of the struggling artist side. Uh, um, you know, the human impact of all this is very hard. Absolutely. Look, and I think, uh, you know, I found myself now reaching out to a lot of people that maybe I didn't have the time to engage with as robustly as I'd like. And I think that's something I encourage everybody to do is certainly reach out to whether it's family, friends, work colleagues, but also, like you said, it's a chance now to also spend more time on a, with people that you want to build a better relationship. And what I found is that those people that were very busy pre-pandemic are a lot more relaxed now. They have a lot more time. So I've been, I've been running myself actually talking to a lot more folks that I typically wouldn't have the time to, to engage with. And likewise, they wouldn't have the time to speak to me or others. So it's allowed me now the time to build better relationships with those folks that typically are not as you know, conveniently reachable during uh, their busy work schedules. Um, and again, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, one of those things where, you know, I think as a music industry as a whole, I know that we're going to get through this and I'm looking at what's happening in different territories, certainly like with New Zealand, Australia, where the, where the curve has pretty much come down or flattened, uh, they're opening up to business as usual in a lot of cases. I'm also seeing certain markets in Europe where things are opening up and also in Southeast Asia and also in Africa, uh, that's been a marketplace too for us. That's been uh, you know, really exciting and buoyant over the past 24 months. And I see that market also becoming, you know, more exciting and important to the global music business. Well, uh, so we appreciate your global perspective from here in Burbank. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. So really appreciate it. Appreciate it. Uh, and our next, our next speaker has a global perspective too. Uh, Glenn Kennel is uh, uh, the president and CEO of Ari. Inc. with uh, a real uh, global footprint, uh, for sure. Uh, they, of course, power uh, the entertainment industry in so many ways. Uh, and, and I'll have to ask you, Glenn, for maybe some help with better lighting and <laughs> everything for my own setup here. <laughs> but, uh, but no, uh, you know, uh, really, uh, really appreciate you making the time to join us. And perhaps if you can just uh, give an overview for those who, who may not be in the industry who don't know uh, the dominant role that you guys play uh, first before you jump into sharing, you know, uh, perspective on the impact on the business. Um, sure. <clears throat> so um, I'm responsible for sales and service of the ARI professional lighting and camera equipment uh, for the Americas market. So I'm actually uh, focused on um, obviously the U.S. and Canadian markets are the biggest for us, but also Mexico and South America as well. Um, but ARI is a global company. We're based in Munich, Germany. We've been in business for 100 years and largely focused on making uh, very high-end professional, again, lighting and camera equipment for film production, for uh, scripted television production, uh, for commercials production. And also we cross over a bit into documentaries and unscripted content too, but most of our business is in the traditional film and television, uh, scripted television space. Um, and of course, that means our business has been uh, impacted quite a bit <laughs> uh, since March. Um, um, our employees are working from home. Uh, we do have some people on furloughs as well. Uh, we are finding that we actually have um, uh, opportunities as well as, I guess, uh, the, the, you know, the threats that we're dealing with, <laughs> opportunities in that our customers are accessible. So reaching out in terms of virtual sales demos, webinars, and training. Um, 
um, becoming adept users of Zoom and all the other tools <laughs> uh, is, is really uh, actually an opportune time for us to connect with our customers and also to develop uh, connection with some new market opportunities. So we are continuing to ship uh, some product largely into the corporate branded media space, uh, tech companies that are developing their own content, um, whether it's for marketing or training purposes, and also into uh, educational and other institutional markets. Um, but our traditional customer base and the core of our, our, our customers uh, is uh, film and television production. Um, we're working very closely with our customers, with uh, the content producers, um, I think uh, actually Peter did a good job of covering the, the trends and the changes in our industry. Uh, increasingly, Netflix and Amazon and Apple are uh, stepping up and, and both uh, funding uh, increased content production, but also developing standards to uh, innovate and to, um, um, uh, to improve the production process. So we've, we've been working with them on that. Uh, in some ways, this uh, disruption of our business and the need now to develop uh, safety protocols and, and distancing and, um, and, and crowd size limitations and things like that is going to probably uh, encourage faster development of, uh, of uh, remote control capabilities, of uh, better integration of our equipment, whether it be camera or lighting, and also of uh, more uh, remote collaboration tools. Um, it, it, these are technologies that have been available, frankly, for some time, but uh, our industry was not quick. It's a quite a risk adverse industry. It was not quick to adopt these changes, uh, but I think we'll see it, 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 it happening more quickly now. Um, but the key for coming back to business, and we do see a pent up demand and probably a very quick ramp up in business, but the key is first establishing these new protocols, the new normal, for production practices, for safety, for protective gear, for testing, for um, basically all of the, the distancing and safety protocols to protect our employees, but to, more importantly, also protect our customers and to allow people to come back to work with confidence. Um, that will require cooperation between the content producers and the, and the people, both the cast in front of the camera and the crew behind the camera, all complying with the new, uh, the new protocols and the new procedures. Um, I do see it happening. There's a lot of activity right now and um, I'm encouraged and I think we'll see production coming back in the July timeframe, maybe even a little bit before then, um, but it really depends on getting all of these protocols in place. So, so in quick summary, there certainly are a lot of threats to our business, but there is pent up demand and there's some big opportunities as well. And uh, the only thing I can say for sure is that the new normal will be different. We will continue to, to, to utilize uh, collaboration tools and virtual tools in a lot of parts of our industry. Um, we'll see, um, you know, I, I think an embracing of some of the new technologies that allow us to work uh, better and more effectively remotely. Um, but of course, there is some things that need to be done in person <laughs> and need to be done uh, in a, in a uh, environment where there's interaction between, uh, between people, whether it's the cast or the crew supporting them. Um, but I, I do, um, I, I'm encouraged. I think in the, we'll see business coming back in a couple of months. Well, that's uh, encouraging. Uh, and I'm curious, you know, uh, uh, what you think, uh, the, the the likelihood is we've all seen stories in the papers too about the the talks ongoing about what the you know protocols would be that would let uh filming start again but uh do you think there's a chance if uh things you know go south cases spike again uh, that could uh you know be postponed further or are you hearing that you know come hell or high water this is you know gonna happen <laughs> the studio is gonna reopen <laughs> well uh, some uh some plans are already being made to start production, um, also to put in place some very strict sequestering of the cast and crew for specific productions, whether you send them to Iceland <laughs> and put them up in a remote hotel where they have absolutely no content with the outside world. By the way, Iceland is a popular production destination. Um, or, you know, just sequestering them in a local studio um, 
Tyler Perry, for example, operates a studio complex in Atlanta. He has a lot of production. It's a former army base. He's got barracks and cottages on his lot that he can assign to production. And he could, he's already floated the idea of inviting a production cast and crew to come sequester within this small community and basically finish their production. It's largely scripted television in a three or four week scenario where they are sequestered from the outside world for that time. Now, these are um, sort of short-term, immediate, um, individual kind of production efforts. What I see is the, the consensus um, agreement between the content producers and the, the, the guilds that represent uh, everyone from directors to producers to uh, cast and crew. That's really important so that people feel comfortable about coming back to work in more, um, well, it, you know, on, on crowded uh, studio stages or on locations where they will not be able to fully sequester <laughs> the cast and crew and will need to have protocols in place. I do see, you know, daily measurement of temperatures and maybe even, you know, antibody tests before people enter the set. Um, and I see very strict adherence to the, uh, yeah, the, the safety and distancing protocols that are being established now are being developed by, you know, both the medical organizations, but now being discussed by the production community. And looking at uh, the impact, particularly, uh, you know, on Burbank uh, companies. I mean, obviously we have the, the giants, which are, you know, giant studios, which are leading these efforts and what these protocols will be. But what about the, the smaller voiceover studios, you know, smaller production studios, smaller mom and pop sh uh, shops? Uh, do, you, do you think that uh, they should have, you know, hope that um, they'll be able to rev up uh, in some way alongside, uh, you know, the larger companies? Or will they start seeing business uh, just as you're projecting you know, that your business uh, will, will start coming back or should they really brace themselves for, you know, a longer, longer struggle here? Well, uh, again, I do think there's a pent up demand for content production and all of the various services that support it. Uh, the question will be is how long is the shutdown and when does it come back and how fast does it come back? Uh, smaller companies don't necessarily have the same reserves as bigger companies. Um, I hope that they're applying for payroll protection and the other uh, assistance that the government has made available. Um, uh, but so I, I, I'm, you know, I believe the business will come back, and I believe there will be opportunity for all who provide services and support to the business. It's just really a question of the timing, and you know, and and how quickly it'll come back. Um, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm more, I guess I would say I'm fairly uh, cautiously optimistic that the, there's, the incentives are right for everyone to get together to establish these new protocols and then to put in place the safety requirements so people can come back to work and can manage the risk. Um, albeit, you know, if we have, you know, a second wave or a remission in the numbers, um, we'll have to step back again, you know, but I, I hope that we have made enough progress that it, and again, not rushing back to work this month, but maybe in two months, you know, uh, we'll be ready to manage it. And Peter, I want to bring you back in too. Uh, you've also got a legal background too. Uh, I know there's discussions underway on the national level about uh, what sort of legal protections companies will have or not. Uh, obviously, <laughs> worker safety comes first, but uh, what's your sense of what you're hearing, uh, you know, in terms of small businesses in the entertainment industry that are on this uh, webinar? Um, you know, is that is that uh, your sense too, that uh, there's, you know, going to be that opportunity to meet the pent-up demand, or should they really brace themselves, Peter, for, uh, you know, more trouble? <laughs> well, look, you know, first of all, <clears throat> Haven't played lawyer for a couple decades. So I want to be clear to everybody. Um, so uh, uh, just on pure, there's gonna be a lot of litigation around everything. So that's, that's all I can say about that. So I can't speak any more intelligently than that. When it comes to production itself, um, obviously Glenn is the expert on this. And so just the, what I hear is the, the bottleneck, just the lo pure logistics once the doors open again, that's going to be a tremendous dilemma. Like I said, the money will be there. The, the, 
streaming wars, all these trends, all this great, this, there's this demand for content that will only increase over time. I'm tremendously optimistic for creators, tremendously, and for IP owners. It's a question of um, just having the resources necessary to be able to do that, but the money is gonna be there with all the large competitors, and not just the large guys, but there's so many players across the board who need to compete and win and find their audiences, so the money will be there. Uh, I go back to the experimentation time. I do think that the, because there, has, that there is right now, just like we're doing, we're doing things like this more now than we have ever before. So we are all getting more comfortable doing that. Many, of, many people weren't comfortable even doing this. Now they will be. They're starting to play with other sorts of collaboration tools. They will get more, more um, comfortable with them. And tech companies will be developing more collaboration tools that are specifically focused on Hollywood for creative production, not just you know, using Google Docs or something like that. You're gonna have production tools that are created. In the music side, there are so many things that are happening now, just not live streaming, but a great immersive technology. So for artists to participate, and Lindsay Sterling is one that if you wanna check her out, all the kinds of virtual things that she does, where she's interacting live from her home with avatars who are actually people. So, and, and the fans are able to interact with her virtually. And there's gonna be a lot more of that. Another company to check out there, Red Pill VR, Red Pill VR, doing really cool sorts of immersive things. So like on the production side, I just go back to more than ever, it's time to be entrepreneurial and use this time that we have, which is, it's terrible times, but as, as Seth was saying too, it gives us a time to reflect more and to learn more and play more and, and try things that we otherwise wouldn't have the time to do. And that may open up tremendous new possibilities and efficiencies. And uh, so I'm an optimist. Well, that's great. And you know, Stat, I'm curious, we have a question too from an anonymous attendee, uh, kind of about the economics. Uh, you know, of, of things, uh, given that a lot of artists are working harder for less now, you know, they're releasing things online just to stay engaged. Uh, is there, you know, money, will there be that pent up demand on the music side or with the dollars flowing again when we come back? Uh, you know, I mean, certainly, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, for Dave and Dave recording studios in Burbank, uh, you know, there will be a lot of folks coming in, uh, hopefully to record soon, but we're looking broadly in the music industry, um, is there a lot of reason for hope or is it going to be tougher with, you know, continuing? I think the reality is it will be tough for a lot of sectors. As I mentioned, the live business, it's going to be tough because you're not really able to sell obviously tickets as much merchandise maybe. But at the end of the day, to Peter's point too, it's time to innovate, right? So you can find ways to still sell tickets to unique experiences, whether it's gifting, whether it's, you know, other ways to monetize that performance, but then also look at ways to tap into new markets. Uh, and there are plenty of tools out there today, whether it's from distribution, streaming, you know, uh, apps, whatever, where you can actually reach many more people than you could even a few years ago. So what I've recommended to a lot of artists too, is like, look at, look at places where you typically weren't able to tour, but let's, figure out ways that you can still get into those markets through different platforms and reach those audiences and build your fan base. Maybe you're selling more physical products. You can still sell merchandise. You can still, you know, get, uh, you know, gifting from some of your fans for certain unique experiences. And when it comes to, you know, the, the monetization of say, for example, uh, licensing, you know, most, most labels and publishers, focus on the domestic market or you know western markets and what i've been saying to a lot of companies now is like look at markets like the middle east southeast asia africa south america where you can license your content and use this time that you have now to explore these new markets of opportunity so there will be some pain but at the same time there's also you know no gain without pain right so you know a few years ago i was talking about disruption well now we have more disruption than ever before so take advantage of that 
you know, and and find find ways to be creative. Mm. Don't be afraid to fail. And that's the one thing I tell all of my clients and my staff is it's okay to fail. As long as you learn from that failure, then you can move on. And it is time to explore. And that's the most exciting thing for me right now is I get to explore now that more explore my, more now than ever before. I, I'm David, more than I, ever. If you just a couple of thoughts on that, because obviously completely agree. For an artist of whatever you are, or a sports figure, or any kind of, uh, for a creator or an artist, it's you really need to be entrepreneurial more than ever because the tools are out there, yeah. and um, and so I'll give you some examples. One thing that I think is really interesting about an artist's ability in the future with these tools now. Yes, we have the traditional paths, and I'm a huge out of home entertainment guy. Music festivals, concerts, those will never go away, never. Uh, but now there is an opportunity for artists to also be in 10 different places in one day, virtually, and monetizing those individually, maybe to a smaller extent each time, but also extremely, uh, it can be extremely, um, uh, you, you can make some really good money that way. So I'll give some examples. So live streaming, yes, with tip jars. F um, free to, because fans, super fans, want to support their favorite artists their livelihood. So it's not like it's begging for money from an artist. It's understanding that this is their life and they're making their art and so enabling them. So to be a patron of the arts, and that's why Patreon is a, a platform that's out there, but that's one example. Um, Cameo is another interesting company to check out. It's a service where an artist is paid a certain amount of money to like say happy birthday, um, David, David Murphy, happy birthday. And it's your favorite, you know, it's your favorite artist or your favorite icon. And if you go to Cameo, you can see, and it's kind of cool. You get an actual message that's recorded just for you. And there's a payment made, but it's not an insane sum of money, but it's also very efficient for the artist to be able to sit in their homes and just say, okay, happy birthday, David Murphy. Hope you're having a great day. Like that's just some small little examples, uh, but this ability. So I would say this virtual presence to scale yourself as an artist, that is something that will extend over time. And, um, and then that's in the real world, virtually, like with live streaming or whatever, or your voice. But then you'll also be able to take advantage of some of these new immersive worlds like we talked about too. And I think that that, again, I really urge you to check out Red Pill VR in terms of just some of the demos that they'll, you can see on that and the performances and and the possibilities. More than anything, it's the possibilities to get you really thinking. I also think, you know, one thing that's really important for artists to do is recognize your fans because so many times artists are really busy. Yeah. Now they get time, acknowledge your fans, ask them what's going on in their lives. Because if you show them the time and respect and the fact that you care, they're gonna care even more about you. And that's one thing, again, I tell the artists is now that you got time, acknowledge your fans, spend more time with them, get to know them. Know that relationship. Yeah, a, a time when uh, lifelong, uh, you know, impacts will be made on how, whether you're an artist or a company, you know, how you handle it and how you treat people, and by all means. And uh, I want to thank all of you, uh, our, our wonderful speakers. We're out of time, but you've made an impact on all of us. Uh, you know, very generous to make the time here, and just want to thank you. Uh, if we were had a, you know, live event, we'd all be applauding, you know, uproariously now. Uh, you, that's great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we will follow up with everyone and, and send the materials around. A big thanks to the city of Burbank for putting this on and, and to our partner, the Burbank Chamber as well. And uh, just want to say best wishes to all of you attendees. Uh, uh, you know, we're rooting for you. Uh, we want to see the Burbank the media cap of the world, uh, you know, will continue uh, even more so as we come out the other side. And uh, let's all help each other out and get through this as best we can. So uh, thank you, everyone. And thank you, guys. Great day. Thank, Thank you. David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. everybody. Bye-bye. Stay, yeah. stay safe and sane. Stay safe. Yeah. I love it.